This is the Catholic Wire. Okay, today we're going to discuss uh, what is probably one of the most delicate topics that we need to discuss among traditional Catholics, and that would be the yeah you can just yeah, not not the whole way so we can listen to them in case they start burning the church. Uh, <laughs> um, It, as, as long as we can hear it, it's safe. When we stop listening to them, then it's like, okay, what's happening? Uh, <clears throat> I was saying it's one of the most delicate topics, and we're going to follow an article written by Father Chicada. Father Chicada, may he rest in peace, um, had the great merit of studying this topic thoroughly. And it's a topic that is uh, quite concerning because of the implications that it has if, if it is you know, whatever the opinion is, whatever the, the outcome is of, of, our, of the research, uh, the implications are great. You have, we have seven sacraments, and of these seven sacraments, two can be ministered by lay people. And this would be baptism, and who knows the other one? Marriage. marriage. Now, just for clarification, marriage can marriage is invested from from one member of the couple to the other, the husband to the wife, and the wife to the husband. But uh, Catholics should always have the priest assisting to the marriage. But the sacrament itself is given by lay people, or by them. Uh, the other sacraments we have: the priest has to give penance. He gives, uh, he consecrates communion or the Eucharist. He is the one that gives extreme unction. In some cases, he has been granted to give confirmation. That has to be with the permission of the bishop and it, only in very, very uh, specific cases. And finally, we have that the sacraments that only the bishop can give are orders, obviously, sacred orders, and confirmation. And obviously all the other ones. Now the priest comes from the bishop, from this sacrament, from the sacrament of orders. What we're discussing right now, well, before I go into that, it's, the bishop himself is consecrated in the same sacrament of orders, it's, it's exactly the same sacrament, but it's just a different formula that is used. But he's consecrated by three bishops, ordinarily. In some cases, in cases of necessity, it can be just one bishop. But the, the normal ritual is to have three bishops. And Pope Pius XII actually said, these are not symbolic. The three of them are given the sacrament. And the reason for this is because it, it is... It's so important that this sacrament is done right, because from this depends all of the other stuff. That's why, that's why the Pope decreed that the three of the bishops are there, and the three of them have to give that sacrament. Just making sure that I'm recording here. I'm going to pass along the article that we're going to cover today. So Father Anthony Cecada writes this article, and he wrote two. He had written one before, before this one, and then he, he writes this one to refute refutations that came against him. You know, some articles were saying, well, no, it's true. So Father Cecada, Father Anthony Cecada, writes one against the validity of the consecration of bishops in the Novo Sordo. And there's a priest from the SSPX, uh, we will see the name here, but in the SSPX, they write an article in favor. Uh, 
I'm going to summarize the article for you. You have it, you can read it. But I'm going to summarize it for you so that we can go faster. So far, do we have, do we have any questions? No? Okay. I probably should have mentioned this, pro this point. What we're discussing is this. In 1968, as the title says, Paul VI changes the right of consecration of bishops. That's the problem. That's what we're discussing right now. Okay? Now, before we go into the problem, I do want to bring the documents right before your eyes so that we compare. Here in this Papal encyclical, which I'm going to pass, I didn't make up, is for everyone because I'm trying to save on paper now. I'm just kidding. I actually just got a donation for paper, so I shouldn't be doing that. No, but I'll pass it around because we're not going to cover the whole encyclical. But this one is uh, an encyclical, or rather, uh, an apostolic constitution of Pius XII, where he established, he said, these are the forms for the order of the priesthood, for the diaconate, for the episcopate. He didn't change them. He just said, this is the matter and the form, because there were questions. People were saying, which part of the prayer is actually the form? Which part of the prayer is the essential one? And so Pius XII, he doesn't change anything, but he just says, this is what it is. This is what is important. So here, from here, we're going to get what's the traditional form of the consecration of bishops, which I will read to you. As I read you this, I want you to compare. Compare. The Pius XII, or the traditional form of consecration of bishops. And I want you to compare the Paul VI one. We will go over it again around the end of the, of the talk or later on. Pius XII tells us in the second paper, in the second page, I should say, the form is this, perfect in thy priest the fullness of thy ministry and clothing him in all the ornaments of spiritual glorification, sanctify, sanctify him with the heavenly anointing. That was the traditional formula for the consecration of bishops. Here's a new one. This is the book that they used to use. This is a 1960-something copy. So now, pour out upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved son, Jesus Christ, the spirit given by him to the holy apostles, who founded the church in every place to be your temple, for the unceasing glory and praise of your name. That is a form of consecration of bishops now. Is there any, any similarity at all? If you notice, it's absolutely different. Every single word is different. There's no, no similarity whatsoever. So I'm going to pass this to you so you can see it with your own eyes. Then you give it back to me. And later on, we'll cover that more in detail. If we look at the article, first let's go to the title. It's absolutely null and utterly void. That's the title of the article by Father Chicana. And I'll explain that article in a bit. He tells us a little bit of story. When the changes come into the church, people are concerned only about the things that they see, right? Because you're a Catholic, you just go to Mass, you try to know your doctrine, you try to go to confession. I mean, you're worrying about the salvation of your soul. So the normal lay people, uh, as you know, many of you live them, um, when they start seeing the changes, they happen very gradually. You know, first is we're going to change this part, then the altar, then... Uh, 
Now we're going to stand up for the, our Father. Now we're going to sit down during the epistle. Um, now we're going to change the epistle and the gospel are going to be in English. The rest of it is in Latin. It was very gradual. And so you didn't notice any essential changes. Then comes a the moment where they change everything to Latin. And here and there you start seeing abuses. And Catholic people react. They react to the things that they see. You know, they react to the fact that the priest is doing crazy things during Mass, that he's bringing balloons, they're having, like, you know, screens with New Age stuff in there. That's story one, one of the stories I heard. Many, many things. The problem of the consecration of bishops, which had happened right after Vatican II, is ignored for a long time because that wasn't the main concern of the people. You know, as a layperson, how many of you have seen a consecration of a bishop? We've never seen, I've never seen one. I, uh, we could have seen one, you know, there was one, two actually in the near past, but most of us, we don't come in touch with that. I'll be honest with you, before I came here to America, when I was in Mexico, I didn't know anything about this consecration of bishops and the priesthood and all that stuff. I had no idea about it. And for the greatest part of my childhood, I didn't even know what was a bishop, because we never saw one in Mexico, so it's like, I didn't know anything about it. So, a lot of people are not worried about this. Now, Father Chicada tells us a story. He says it's in the, in the last paragraph of the first column of the first page. I encountered the issue by chance during my first year at the Society of St. Pius X, Seminary at Econ, Switzerland. Remember that Father Chicada was, was there in, in the SSPX. I went to ask Archbishop Lefebvre, about whether conservative friends from my former seminary could work with the society after ordination. He told me, yes, in principle, but they would need to be conditionally ordained first because Paul VI had changed the right for holy orders. That's Archbishop Lefebvre telling him that. The Archbishop explained that the new form, the essential formula, the one that I just read to you, in the right for priestly ordination, well, that's the Episcopal one, in the right for priestly ordination was doubtful because one word had been subtracted. But in the new form for Episcopal consecration, the one that I just read to you, the Archbishop continued, was completely different and thus it was invalid. Despite the gravity of the question, only a few traditionalist writers examined the post-Vatican II ordination rites, even after Tridentine and Old Masses started to multiply. What happens then? One thing to notice here. What is the position of the SSPX? And as I'm saying these things, I want it to be very clear. I grew up in the SSPX. I know a lot of priests from the, that were, grew up in the SSPX. It's very good people, some of them. Uh, I'm not trying to like bash anyone, okay? This is not a thing of trying to make a party and you know trying to get people to come here. I'm just trying to get to the truth. And that's why I'm trying to bring all these documents to you. The position of the SSPX has varied from they were not valid to maybe they are to they are valid and shush. And this I can prove it very easily. For the longest time, even till recent years, the Society of the St. Pius X had as a policy, if you came from the Novus Ordo, you are reordained. And that's, everybody knows this. I mean, all of you that have been in the tradition for a while know this, that the Society of St. Pius X, if a new priest came, they would reordain him depending on who it was <laughs> that received him, because some of them would not be. And actually, uh, Father Hesse, Gregory Hesse, which has a lot of YouTube videos, and he has one on this topic, he did not join the SSPX because of that, because the SSPX told him you have to be reordained, and he said, I'm not going to be reordained. And that's why he never joined them. And this was in recent years. It was way after uh, Lefebvre passed away. As far as I know, I might be wrong with that. As we are going to see in this, in this article, they kind of waver in the opinions, even at the time of Bishop Lefebvre, Father Smishberger, of whom I won't get into what I've heard, but uh, Father Schmidberger is the one that is telling Bishop Lefebvre, no, they might be valid, they might be valid. So they're kind of like 
researching the topic, but they never go into full detail. When they become valid <clears throat> is when they start negotiations with Rome, because when they begin having negotiations with Rome, and Rome seems to be very friendly, this is at the time of Benedict XVI especially, how can I go to Rome and ask them to work with them if I say that they are not bishops? You know what I mean? That totally puts a kibosh on the whole, on the whole talks of friendliness. So in order for them, and I'm not saying that's the reason why they did it, but it's obviously, it was an obstacle. In order for them to talk with Rome, they needed to recognize the, the, the consecration of bishops. And that's why they start studying the, the matter more deeply. And that's, what, that's when the article from the SSPX comes out, saying the consecration of bishops is valid. And this article here is to rebuke this one, to, to refute, excuse me, this one over here. So far, any questions? No? Okay. So we have three people that are studying the topic. We have Father Checada, the SSPX, and Father Checada actually studied another group from France, which called themselves Rore Santifica, which is part of the formula of the traditional formula for the consecration of bishops. And he mentions that in this paragraph over here, the second to the last in the second column. In the summer of 2005, a French traditionalist publish, publisher, Edition Saint-Rémy, published the first volume of Rore Santifica, again the French accent, huh? a book-length dossier of documentation and commentary on the Paul VI rite of Episcopal consecration. It was, I think he says it in here, but it was like several hundred pages. The study, featuring on its cover side-by-side -side photos of Ratzinger and the SSPX superior, superior Bernard Fillet, concluded that the, that the new rite was invalid. And this is then when the SSPX uh, that are negotiating with Benedict XVI started studying. He says in the last paragraph, the Dominicans in Avrilé, France, a traditionalist religious order in the SSPX orbit, immediately took up the task of trying to make a convincing case for the validity of the new right. And one of them, Father Pierre-Marie, is the one that writes the article in favor, uh, in favor of the, of the consecration of bishops. And then the Angelus uh, translates that into English. Now, something that is interesting about this, kind of uh, ironic, if you see the first page, there's a quote in there by Father Pulvemacher. Once there are no more valid priests, they will permit the Latin Mass. He was the editor of the Angelus before. But then it's the Angelus that publishes that. <clears throat> now, Father Pierre gives two arguments in favor. He says, the form that we just read, the new form, is used in the Eastern Rites and maybe is used or it was at least once used in the ancient church. There is another argument that is made that he will mention, and it is, the, and Father Gregory Hesse gives that argument too. They say, the context saves it. Now, these are the arguments that he uses in favor. So now we're gonna go into the actual argumentation. You know, how do we determine this truth? Any questions so far? No? Are we totally confused, or is it going okay? Okay, because I, I might be jumping back and forth, but uh, isn't, it wouldn't be you, it would be me that I'm jumping back and forth. Um, something that we should uh, consider here from Father Chicada's article, and this is a good principle for us to apply as traditional Catholics, as I've been saying, and I always say, 
there is many websites out there putting all this stuff. There is a lot of people claiming all these things, uh, priests that shoot from the hip. And, you know, that's something I, I don't want to... You know, a lot of times priests are very busy uh, and one can make mistakes, that's for sure. But when we're talking about very momentous stuff, you know, very serious stuff, we should ask for sources. And so when someone comes and gives me an article or a web page or something, they should give me sources, traditional Catholic books from before Vatican II that are, that are sustaining what you say. And that's a very good thing about Father Checada. When I was reading this article, I know how hard it is to research. I know how hard it is to find some of these books. Uh, some of them you can't find. And so when I was reading the article and I was seeing the books that he quotes, uh, that, that tells you a lot of knowledge. First, in finding those books, because just finding them is incredibly hard. And second, because a lot of the books that he finds, that he quotes, any priest should be able to read in Latin. But not every priest will quote books that are read, uh, written only in Latin. And the books of moral theology, of canon law, all those things, when you really want to get deep doctrine, you know, not just the textbook, but actually like really deep, uh, the really deep foundations of the doctrine, you need to go to the books that are written in Latin. And all of these books that he's quoting, that I know them, are books that are very, very good of moral theology. And he's giving quotation after quotation after quotation. He's quoting all the sources. So what are the principles then? We have to, we have to solve the question. <clears throat> are they valid or not? If we go to the principles to apply, that's the first part that Father Chekada gives us. Let's begin by, by explaining this. What is the sacramental form? Meaning, you know this from your catechism. When I give a sacrament as a priest, there are a lot of prayers and rites around the sacrament that are meant to, to increase the disposition of the person, to favor the devotion of the priest, also to increase the disposition of the priest, to pray to God that other graces are bestowed. When you have the, the baptism, you see there's like three or four pages of prayers. But the essential part of baptism, the one that, is, that you cannot miss, is the form, right? The matter and the form. And form. If I, as a priest, omit some of the prayers, it would be sinful if I do it on purpose. But if I say the matter and the form, I did baptize, okay? Let's say that I have a baby and I skipped the page even. But then I went to the form and I said, the matter, I poured the water on the baby's head so that it flowed. And then the form, I baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. If I did those two things, even if I missed the other prayers, the baby was baptized. The sacrament took place. If I did all the other prayers, but I missed that part, then I miss the sacrament. I prayed a lot for the baby, but he never got baptized. Okay? So this is what we're looking for. The matter, Father Chekada will tell us, is something or action that your senses can perceive. You know the matter in form of several of the sacraments. In baptism is the pouring of the water. In confirmation is the anointing on the forehead. Uh, in extreme unction is the anointing of the senses or, or of the forehead as well. The form is the words. Now, just to, to explain a little bit about the form. <clears throat> I can pour water on someone for many reasons. What makes that a sacrament, someone, someone laughed back there. <laughs> what makes that a sacrament is the meaning that I give it with my words, right? I can pour water on someone with baptismal water and everything, but if I say, you know, I don't know, it's hot today, there's no meaning to that. What This is called the form because it forms the action. It gives it a shape. It, in other words, it makes it what it is. The words that I pronounce give to that right, to that uh, external right, the meaning that it's supposed to have. And when I have both, when I have that meaning, then I have the sacrament taking place. Here we're talking about the change in the form.
Now in B, in point B, he explains what I just explained to you. Now in point C comes a question. What if there is a change in the form? How do you know when it's valid or when it's not valid? And here, let's say that someone changes the form, whether by mistake or on purpose. There would be two kinds of changes. One would be substantial, Another, another one would be accidental. You know what these words mean? If I take, a, if I take a, a, for example, a chair and I paint the chair. It's an accidental change. If I burn the chair, if I destroy it, then it's a substantial change. Then it, that didn't take place anymore. In the form, if I, for example, when I'm baptizing, if I say one word extra, or if I replace a word by accident, but the meaning remains, then it's just an accidental change. If I change the meaning, then it's a substantial change. And he gives us an example here. It's in the first column. <clears throat> oh, I figured, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, are there any questions so far? Actually, she has a wicked one. Okay. Blame it on her. Oh, yeah, it's just the, you've been, like, Arizona baptism, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. 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 Y
we have several rites, meaning several rituals, that are all good, valid, and Catholic. The Latin rite is the one we belong to. It's the one that says everything in Latin, the one that you're familiar with. There are also Greek rites and Eastern rites. And these are the ones that he's mentioning here. I'll just put it as one, although there is several. These are rites that have also an apostolic origin, that have different languages, but they're all, sub they're all subject to Rome. And as we discuss this, Father Cecada here is going to tell us, even though they use different words sometimes, the meaning, the substance is the same. Okay? They might use different prayers, they might use some different rites around it, but it's always the same in the meaning and the substance of it. And the church studies that. When, the Catholic, when these Eastern rites, some of them became schismatic for a moment, and he gives us the story here of some of, some of them. <clears throat> and then they came back to the church. And whenever they came back to the church, Rome would study their rites. And they would say, okay, these are still the rites that you had when you were Catholic. These are still valid. They mean the same thing, so they're good. We approve them, right? And that's what they would do. The claim that they have with the new consecration of bishops is that it was supposedly used in the Eastern rites. And we will go into that. Any questions about that? No? Okay. A story here just to, uh, to make a coffee break. There was, in, when Bishop was growing up, he was a teenager, and they had uh, an Eastern church that was Catholic and the Latin rite. But the priest in the Eastern church barely spoke any English. And he would say that a lot of... Uh, Teenagers and young people would go there for confession because it was a lot easier with him. <laughs> it was like, okay. <laughs> okay. That, that encyclical that I was passing around the, the, is the encyclical by Pius XII that I was talking about. Gives us, this is point number E, what are the requirements? for the form. In holy orders. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but Mexican people have a lot of uh, sound effects. <laughs> they would always make... Yeah, yeah. They would always tell me that in the seminary. That's the question that you were asking. So when it comes to the sacrament of holy orders, how do I know when the change is going to be accidental or substantial? And that Pius XII gave us in that encyclical. He said, they must unequivocally, that's uh, this paragraph over here, the form has to unequivocally signify the sacramental effects, that is, the power of the order of the order that is being given. So, for example, if you're a priest, it has to signify that you're going to be able to offer the sacrifice of the Mass, all those things. If you're a bishop, it has to signify that you'll be able to consecrate pri to ordain priests, to consecrate altars, all those things. And it has to signify the grace of the Holy Ghost. And he says, univo univ I don't know how you pronounce that, univocally? Unevocally. Unevocally. <clears throat> what this means is that there has to be only one meaning to that. It cannot be something ambiguous. Okay? It cannot be something that could mean one thing or the other. It has to signify, without any ch chance of error, the power of the order that is being given and the grace of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Did, you, did everybody see the this? When he speaks, we will go to the page four. 
when he speaks of the, the consecration of bishops, you have it there too, in the page four in the top, you'll notice that it has these both, po both of these points. Completing thy priest, the fullness of thy ministry. It's a priest, and he's saying complete the fullness of thy ministry. Meaning, the fullness of the ministry of the priesthood is episcopacy. It's very clear. And adorned in the raiment of all glory, sanctify him with the dew of heavenly, heavenly anointing. Heavenly anointing signifies the grace of the Holy Ghost. Unevocally. That's the words, Rore Santifica, is that part over there. It's the part that says, the dew of heavenly anointing, sanctify. Rore, dew, sanctifica, sanctify. Heavenly anointing is something that can only be applied to the Holy Ghost. It's, if you look at the, at the sequence of, of uh, the day of Pentecost, it refers to the Holy Ghost as that, as heavenly anointing. Anointing, the, the oil is always referred to the Holy Ghost, always to the Holy Ghost. Never that I know of, at least, is referred to any other of the two persons. So the traditional form has these two points. Does the new one do? Does. Does the new one do? Let's look at the origin of the new rite, and for this I will read. It's uh, part two. In 1964, Paul VI entrusted implementing the liturgical changes prescribed by Vatican II to a new Vatican agency known as the Concilium. This organization was composed of several hundred clergymen divided according to their areas of expertise into 39 study groups. The secretary was Annibale Bugnini, whom many of you already know, who was a modernist, and some say a Freemason, and who had written actually the document of, this, of the Vatican Council II, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. The study group number 20 had the task of reforming the rites of holy orders, and the head was, we gotta keep some of these names uh, present. The head of the group of study was Dom Bernard Bot, I suppose you pronounce it, who was a specialist in Oriental rites. So he was the one that proposes that one of the texts of a book that he had written, I, I, I skipped that part, but I should probably mention it. Bernard Bot writes a study, he, he collects uh, several works from the Old Fathers, from the First Fathers, and he writes, or he publishes, I should say, what's called the Apostolic Tradition of Saint Hippolytus. This is basically what he did is he was researching in libraries here and there. He collected all these really ancient writings, supposedly of St. Hippolytus, and he publishes all as a collection. That's something that is common. Many people do. There's many works like that. We'll look into the story of that later. So in this is where he finds a Eucharistic prayer that goes into the mass, into the new mass, and he finds also what was supposedly a consecration of bishops, and he proposes that they take the text from here, to make the new consecration. Let's read. His most famous academic achievement was a new scholarly edition of the Apostolic Tradition of St. Hippolytus, a collection of ancient Christian liturgical texts. One of these would become the new Mass Eucharistic Prayer Number 2, minus its original references to the devil, hell, the salvation of just believers alone, and the sacrificing priest, meaning they took all those references out because it wasn't fitting to Vatican II. Dombot proposed that another text from this same collection be introduced into the rite of Episcopal consecration to replace the traditional one. The old preface, he said, had poor doctrinal content, was oriented almost exclusively towards the bishop's liturgical role, was a hybrid por formula, poorly balanced. Something was needed to better express the theology, theology excuse me, of Vatican II. The prayer for Episcopal consecration from Hippolytus said them both survived in more evolved versions in the Syrian and Coptic Eastern Rites. Used in the Roman Rite, he said it would also affirm a unity of outlook between East and West in the Episcopacy. That is, 
it, will, it would thrill the student systematics who also used these rights. So it was ecumenical, and so it was very good for Vatican II. So the text that they found here in both uh, work was taken almost verbatim to make the new formula, the one that we read in this book over here. Let's keep reading because this is something that we kind of have to cover in detail. Point number three. Paul VI designated the following passage in the preface as a new form for the consecration of a bishop. It's the one that we read. So now pour out upon this chosen one that power which is from you, the governing spirit whom you gave to your beloved son. We read it already. At first glance, he says, it does seem to mention the Holy Ghost. However, it does not appear to specify the power of holy order being conferred, the fullness of the priesthood that constitutes the episcopacy, that the traditional form so clearly expressed. So remember. Um, in the new form, we're looking to see is the power of orders signify is the grace of the Holy Ghost signify signified and that univocally unambiguously so Father Chicada is going to basically go to each one of the arguments in favor and just rebuke them. The first one, is it an Eastern Rite? If we find that this formula that we read was truly used in an Eastern Rite, that solves the question. We don't have to worry about it. Because then it means that the Church at one point approved of it, and then we know for sure that is correct. Now, something that I want to say here just briefly is this. As a priest myself, we're not looking for one or the other. If, uh, if there's pros and cons to this question, whatever answer it might be. If, if we were to find out that the orders are valid for them, that would actually make life easier for us in certain ways. Because then people would be already con uh, confirmed the sacraments would be valid in many cases. Many more people would have an opportunity to save their souls, perhaps. Uh, there would be also a lot of more complications in other sense. But as a priest, I don't lean one way or another, right? But what I want to know is the truth so that I know how to act properly. In his apostolic constitution, he tells us in the last paragraph, promulgating the new rite, Paul VI says that the new preface for Episcopal consecration is taken from the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus which continues to be used in large part, quote unquote, for Episcopal consecrations, as we said, in the Coptic and West Syrian. But is this true? How do we know if this claim is true? We need to know in these Eastern rites that they're claiming, Is that the form, really? And how do you find that out? Well, you have to go in, you have, you have to go and look into the books that they use, see if that's what they say that's the form, and then see if that's true, if we can compare it to the one from Paul VI. Now, let's see the points that the Father Chiquette is going to give us, he says, two general points immediately emerged to defeat the Eastern Rite argument. First, the sacramental form, form that Paul VI prescribed for conferring the Episcopacy consists, so as we're comparing this, we will compare the Paul VI one and the ones from the Eastern Rites, and let's see what we come up with. For this comparison, he uses a book that he quotes here in the footnote number 23, that is very, very hard to get. It's by Densinger, the one that wrote the, the one that we know with the Magisterium of the Church. And it's called Ritus Orientalum Coptorum Sirorum et Armenorum. So what, what do we see when we compare them? The one from Paul VI is one sentence. The form. The one from the Eastern Rites 
is several hundred, several hundred words long. So here we have a problem. Already we're not the same. This is 42 words over here in Latin. If you compare them both, I don't have the book, I'll try to get it, but I don't have it yet. If you compare them both, he tells us in point two. You could not even claim that the entire Paul the sixth preface of Episcopal consecration, meaning the whole, the whole of the preface, not just the form, is a form that is used in these two rites, because it contains some phrases here and there found in the Eastern Rite forms, but there are significant omissions and variations, so it's not identical. So in, in short words, the sentence that we read from this book, you cannot find them textually in any Eastern Rite. It's not the same. You find some words that are here and there, but not the full sentence. Again, I'll try to find the book so that we can someday compare them, actually, you know, see it. But then he's going to go into the two Coptic, Coptic Rites that are supposedly the source of it. The Coptic, excuse me, the two Eastern Rites. The Coptic and the Maronite. And let's see what he tells us. He gives us a little bit of the history of the Copts. As I said, they were in Sism at some point, and then they come back. In the third paragraph, he says, In 1898, their synod decreed that for the three major orders in the Coptic Rite, the form is the actual prayer which the ordaining bishop recites while imposing hands on the ordinant. The 19th century dogmatic theologian, Enric Densinger, that's the one I was telling you about, He's the one that wrote the Inquiridion Symbolorum. He published the collection of Eastern Rite liturgical texts, the Ritus Orientalium. And in this work, he specifies that the sacramental form for Episcopal consecration in the Coptic Rite is the prayer, he tells us. What is the prayer? The one that says, Quies Dominator Deus, etc. Now, what, as we were saying, in this prayer in the Coptic Rite, the prayer that is the form is 340 words. As compared to 42. This one mentions sacramental powers proper to the order of bishop alone. It says, in the form, it says that you're giving the grace of the, to the bishop to provide clergy according to his commandment for the priesthood to make new houses of prayer to consecrate altars. So they are mentioning Powers of orders in the Coptic Rite. But the, in the Paul VI, they omit this power of orders mentioned from the Coptic. They don't mention anything about the bishop consecrating altars or anything like that. Now he says, though the Paul VI preface surrounding the new form contains many phrases found in the Coptic form, for example, governing spirit, there is the word governing spirit in here, and it's also here, a sentence, a word. However, all these other phrases that refer to the power of orders are missing. And this omission, he says, is particularly significant because the dispute over the validity of the Paul VI form revolves around whether it adequately expresses the power of order. Any questions so far? No? Let me know if you need to take a break. I'm hoping... Okay, the Maronite Rite. He also tells us a little bit of the story. They were also in Sism at some point. They come back, and the form, the last previous to the last paragraph, in Densinger, they also give us the form. Is the prayer that begins Deus cu universum ecclesiam tuam peristos pontifices, etc., etc. If we compare this one to the Paul the Six, this is also three hundred and seventy words long. In it, they also mention that the candidate, meaning the person that is going to be consecrated, received the sublime episcopal order, begging God to perfect his grace and priestly ministry. Again, power of orders, words that were also omitted in the Paul VI one. In point number two, he'll tell us again, there are some words in common. 
On the following page of the Maronine Rite for Episcopal cons Consecration, there is a prayer that has some phrases in common, again, governing spirit, loose bonds, but those prayers are not part of the form. You can read the rest of it, but the point is neither this nor this are the same. There's one more, the Syrian word, right? Gives us a story again. They were also in schism. They come back to the church. And again, the book of Densinger tells us the form, which is uh, the prayers that are used by the Maronites or another, Deus qui omnia per potentium tuam. Again, if we compare it, this is 230 words long. And this, even in more detail, enumerates the specific, the specific sacramental powers of the bishop. He says, May the bishop create priests, anoint deacons, consecrate altars and churches, bless houses, call forth vocations to ecclesiastical work. So as you see, the three of them mention the power of orders. This one doesn't. I'll skip part of it, you can read it on your own. But the conclusion, as we see in point D, in page 7, is, can we say that the new form employed in a Catholic Eastern Rite as a sacramental form for, con for conferring the Episcopacy? The answer is no. The Paul VI form is not identical to any Eastern Rite. And in particular, the biggest problem is that all the Eastern Rites mention the power of orders, while this one doesn't. Any questions on that? No, I think it's very clear. Hopefully we can get that book one day. I'll ask you for donations. <laughs> Just kidding. I'll be like, yeah, there's uh, one collection in the library in Alexandria. It's going to be $4,000. Um, I'll have to fly there too and spend a couple of weeks in there. I don't think that even exists anymore as a country. But. Anyways, okay, point number five. So we see that it's not an Eastern Rite. It's not. Is it maybe another approved form? Was the new form employed as a sacramental form for conferring the Episcopacy in some other rite in the past? So. We covered the, the, pre, the, the ones that are right now, that we know right now is not being used. But remember, we were talking about the apostolic tradition of St. Hippolytus. So maybe in the past it was used by the church and approved by the church. That would be harder to determine. But if in the past it was used by the church, same thing. The question would be solved because that means that it's valid. Such evidence, though not as strong a proof for validity as used in a Catholic Eastern Rite, would still add some weight to the argument that the new form is valid. And so he mentioned, as I said, that it was taken from this book. And Father Pierre-Marie used uh, this argument that it was used in the ancient church, supposedly. How much certitude can we have? So the question here is, is this text Certain? Can we rely on it? How much certitude, Father Chacada says, can we have that these texts themselves were actual sacramental forms used to confer the episcopacy? And two, that they received at least tacit approval from the church as such. So first of all, were these texts real and really used for that? And were they approved in reality, or were they just maybe a schismatic text? Because you gotta remember, in the first times of the church, there were sects, there were schismatic sects, and they had invalid orders as well. So we have to, to ascertain these two points. And this is where it gets really, really murky. Let's go to point number eight. Let's see some of the problems. When we're talking about this book, 
there have been several people that have studied these ancient writings. No, point number two tells us the identity, the identity of the author who really wrote these works. Not this book that he published, but the ancient writings, who wrote them. The Jesuit expert on Eastern liturgist, Jen Michael Hansens, devotes nearly 100 pages to trying to identify who is this Hippolytus? Who is this author of these ancient writings? Was he the same Hippolytus associated with the Easter computation table? Was he the one that was represented by a statue? Was he reputed, the one reputed to be a native Roman? Was he the Egyptian one? Was he the Pope's counselor or the anti-Pope? Was he the priest, Hippolytus, a bishop, the martyr? Because there are several. How do we know who he was? And the best way we can manage to understand that is by conjecture. We don't have anything, absolutely anything, to prove who this person was. The origin. Where did this book come from? Did it come from Rome, Alexandria, Egypt? We don't know. We have to guess, yes. Wouldn't he be a saint, though? I mean, if the church declared him a saint, wouldn't that have a track record? So there are several Hippolytus? saints. There were several, several saints, Hippolytus. Okay. But there's also an anti-pope. And there were a bunch of them. So we don't really know who it was that wrote it. Even saints were wrong sometimes. But also another thing to consider, and this is something that whoever has studied patristics knows it, uh, it was a custom in the ancient times to make books and ascribe them to another person. They didn't see that as plagiarism as we do now. For them, it was just like, oh, you know, yeah, St. Peter, written by St. Peter. That's why you have so many apocryphal works. You have the Gospel of St. Peter, the Gospel of St. John, the Gospel of, the, of this and that. There is like, I think, 70-something apocryphal works that were very, very widely spread in the ancient church. So you have a bunch of stuff like that. Even, for example, the works of Origen that are very famous. He wrote like, there's like six volumes, big volumes with very tiny letters, kind of like Father Radecki's book, maybe in 200 years ago. Like, who was Father Radecki? Which one was it? <laughs> <laughs> they, they were twins. <laughs> so the, the works of Origen, we don't know what he wrote. We have what got to us. But most people believe that they were interpolated, meaning that people went and introduced stuff in there just to, to approve their own heresies. So Origen has been accused of heresy for a long time, and some recent studies have determined, no, this, these things were not from Origen. It's very complicated to determine where it came from. So age, how old is this? Usually is dated around 215 after Christ, after Anno Domini. But he says, this is, he's quoting here the, the studies from the Jesuit. And this Jesuit says, The section dealing with ordination may have been retouched by 4th century hands in order to bring it into line with current doctrine and practice. Retouched, more conjecture. Now, what about, maybe, maybe Don Bernard Bode had the originals. Maybe he has like the old pergaments, you know, the old rolls, where you can actually go and see well, where these were actually written by the saint, right? Well, here's what the Jesuit says again. The Greek original of the document did not survive. We don't have the originals. We don't have the originals in the same language except in the form of a few isolated fragments. What does that mean? That this book was not, he's not like he grabbed the book and he just, you know, translated it to English. He had a piece of paper here, a piece of paper there, another piece of paper here. From there, through studies, they come together with the whole thing, right? The Greek original of the document has not survived, except in the form of a few isolated fragments. That means... It has to be reconstructed from an extant Latin translation and from later Coptic, Arabic, and Ethiopic versions. You have all these different versions and you have to reconstruct the text. As well as from the use made of it by compilers of later church orders, which, and this is what, this is not Father Chekada, this is the Jesuit author, increases the difficulty of determining exactly what the author wrote. 
And so even Dom Bernard bought his book, he put this subtitle in the book. Essay de Reconstitution. Ah, my French is getting better. <laughs> An attempt at reconstruction. So notice here, this is something, you know, it's not Father Chacada mentioning this like, oh, I say that. It's like they themselves say it. That this is not a reliable source. And there was at least six other scholars that tried the same thing to reconstruct this text. And even Don Bot says in the introduction, he's quoting him there. Reconstruction can bring us back only to an archetype and not the original. So more conjecture. So was this reliable? I'm not, say, I'm not gonna say if it's reliable or not. You tell me if you find that reliable. If, if, if you think that would be something that you would want to base a sacrament on, I would not. The other question is, was this liturgical ever? Was this approved by the church? Don Bode, again, in 1963, in the same book, he says, in this same book, he says, it is not easy to distinguish what represents a real usage from the ideal. The prayers the apostolic tradition contains were given as models, not as fixed formulas. He himself is saying it. The same one that put this book in here, the same one that, that proposed that it would be used here, he himself is saying it. These texts were used as models, not as fixed formulas. And then he says, again, don't vote. And I'll try to get that book too. Uh, how would you pronounce the last name? We go with both? Yeah. Okay. Its origin, whether Roman or Egyptian, is not really important here. Meaning, if this book came from Rome or Egypt, Egypt, it doesn't matter. Even if it's a, doc, a Roman document, it should not be viewed as the Roman liturgy of the third century, a time when the liturgy left a great deal of room for a celebrant to improvise. He himself, again, is saying this should not be seen as the Roman liturgy. And so, multiple volumes of scholarly works produce a model for an Episcopal consecration prayer that was not necessarily followed word by word anyway. Okay, just very briefly covering the other questions. They call it the apostolic tradition in, in, the, in the work itself. But, as he himself says again, both, they, are, they appear to have originated in Syria and is, this is another, this is another, uh, another scholar, Bradshaw. And it's generally thought to be the work of an Arian heretic who was to some extent composing an idiosyncratic idealization rather than always reproducing exactly liturgical practice with which he was familiar. Meaning another scholar thinks that this work was composed by a heretic. C, Testament of our Lord, because it's also called like that. And again, another impressive title, but then this would be also Bradshaw that says probably dates from the 5th century that seems again to be, have been composed in Syria and he says although originally written in Greek it is extant only as we said in Syria, Arabic, Ethiopic versions and it is doubtful how far it represents actual historical practice. Now is it approved by the church? That's the next point. We have no idea. That's the conclusion of this. We have no idea because, first of all, we don't have the originals. Second, we only have reconstructed texts from very different fragments that even the scholars themselves disagree where it came from. We don't know whether if they were actually used as formulas as both himself recognized. And we have no record whatsoever of it ever being used at all in the church. So, uh, do you want to break? No, that's that's very good because here's the thing. I'll, I'll recognize that I'm a young priest. I still need to study a lot, and difficult questions. I'll just cut them off the video, and then <laughs> I'll study it, and then I'll ask, I'll tell you later. And if I don't know, <laughs> if I don't know, I'll, I'll oh, I didn't. I was not supposed to erase this. If I don't know, I'll I'll let you know. I don't know, and I'm just seeing a glaring 
something that could be used against it. It says, if in the old days, quoting from here, it says, there was a great deal of room for a celebrant to improvise, and that would be a valid sacrament. How could they not use that same argument? Say, well, the celebrant was allowed to improvise in this year, whatever you mm -hmm. say, 300 or whatever, third century. Mm -hmm. What's to say that a celebrant improvising now would be invalid? You see what I'm saying? Well, if he could improvise then and it was valid, I'd like to say I'm being the devil advocate. Mm -hmm. How would changing a word now make it invalid? Is it the discipline of the church mm -hmm. that codified it that now makes it invalid? Well, notice something though that he's not saying that the 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 scholar that is saying that they were allowed, or rather, that there was room for improvisation. He's not saying that that made it valid. That was an abuse, actually. So uh, back in, you know, remember that in the old times of the church, communications were not as now. Mm -hmm. So if there was an abuse in the church, it would take like, what, a year to get to Rome or to anywhere else to the bishop. And that's why there were so many abuses that were introduced in the church. And that was actually one of the purposes of the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. to kind of, to, at that time there was more communication. And the point of the Council of Trent was to put a system that would avoid all of those abuses. So he's saying that there was room for the celebrant to improvise, but not that that was a good thing or valid. Okay, thank you. And I would say that uh, if we do look at the tradition of the church, uh, that room was given in the ceremon ceremonies around it. But the, the liturgy itself varied from the rites, from the different rites, but not in the substance, but unless it was an abuse. Well, like the Greeks used, or the Eastern rite, I should say, use leavened bread, you use unleavened bread, so that's an absolute substance difference, but reflects completely differently. Mm -hmm. How does that get approved? Because that was from apostolic tradition. That was from the very beginning of the Eastern rites, they right. used leavened bread, and that was always approved by the church. So that has been always valid matter. There was no change there. Um, the liturgies from the East come uh, from the Apostle St. James, most of them, from the Liturgy of St. James. And that liturgy always from the very beginning used that. So I was just thinking about an example of that abuse. You know, the I won't remember the names or the dates, but there was a big controversy in the first times of the church about baptism, because as you all know, uh, some, some were rebaptizing heretics. You know, a person was baptized in heresy, and they thought we have to rebaptize them. And that went on for years and years and years, because again, those are things that you would not be talking to Rome all the time. It took you a long time to get there. Only when it came to the, to the knowledge of the Pope, did he say, you have to stop that right away. Uh, I think that's the kind of room that they meant. You have to stop that right away. And it is after that that the church was very, very strict with the rebaptizing. That is it's almost like a heresy, you know, if you, if you hold that. Um, not what we do here. What we do here is conditional baptism or, you know, in tradition. But I think that that's what they meant. No, but those questions are greatly appreciated. Okay, so I'll have to cut minute number one. Oh, wait, just kidding. Okay, the fourth point. Um, I apologize if it, this is going pretty long, but I think it's a very important issue. The fourth point is, what about power of the episcopacy? Okay, so it's not in the Eastern Rites. It wasn't used in the ancient church, at least... It's very, very doubtful. The question is, do we, ha do we have these two things, the power of the, go of the orders and the grace of the Holy Ghost? So does the new sacramental form univocally signify the sacramental effects, the power of order, and the grace of the Holy Ghost? And he is going to analyze the form again. So now, pour out upon this chosen one that power which is from you. The governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the spirit given by him to the holy apostles, who founded the church in every place to be your temple for the unceasing glory and praise of your name. The form seems to signify the grace of the Holy Ghost, but the problem is the words governing spirit, spiritum principalis. Because governing does not necessarily mean bishop. This expression, governing spirit, is at the heart of the dispute 
Now, something that is very interesting is what he's going to cover in point A. In the sessions where they were coming up with this Episcopal consecration, right there when they were studying and when they proposed it, someone raised this question. Someone said, this does not seem valid. The Spiritum Principalis does not seem to signify the Holy Ghost. The casual, the casual reader will, of course, be tempted to dismiss this as some crackpot traditionalist fever dream. I love how, how he writes in those kind of cases. <laughs> but 40 years ago, even before the new rite was promulgated, a member of the study group that created the new rite of Episcopal consecration, consecration raised this precise issue. This is what is really hard to find, this document that he's quoting from. Uh, in an October 14, 1966 memo, Bishop Juan Hervás y Benet, the ordinary of Ciudad Real, Spain, and a promoter of the Opus Dei, wrote to fellow study group members. It would be necessary to establish undeniably that the new form better and more perfectly signifies the sacramental action and its effects. That is to say, that it should be established in no uncertain terms that it has no ambiguity. But remember, it has to be unequivocally. And that it omits nothing from among the principal charges which are proper to the Episcopal order. A doubt occurs to me concerning the words Spiritum principal, Spiritus Principalis. Do these words adequately signify the sacrament? We don't know if he received an answer, but the question was raised already then. Here's something very, very interesting. Paul VI promulgates the new rite in 1968. And obviously, remember, Novo Sordo, we're doing it now in different languages. So when they say, when they see Spiritus Principalis, everybody starts asking, what does that mean? How do we translate it? And so the English translation, the first one, put excellent spirit, which could be anything. I mean, the excellent spirit could be the spirit of, of God the Father, the Spirit of God the Son, anything. As the Spirit, in the French, they put it as the Spirit that makes chiefs or leaders. In German, the Spirit of a guide. And this expression obvious, obviously led to some bishops to be worried about it and to fear about the apostolic succession. How do you know? Because Rome, in 1973 and then in 1974, issues two declarations about the sacramental forms which, again, I'll try to get as well. He, he, let's look at the, at the footnote there, because it's important. What, some of what these documents from Rome said. The second document explained that when the Holy See approves a translation, it judges that it rightly expresses the meaning intended by the Church, but that it also stipulates that the translation is to be understood in accord with the mind of the Church as expressed by the orig original Latin text. This statement, he says, Father Chacada, is bizarre. A translation either conveys the substantial meaning of the Latin, or it does not. If the latter it is invalid, no matter what anyone stipulates. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, remember that the forms were in the rights, you were saying the form in the language. So if the translation is inappropriate, then the right is inappropriate because you're, 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 saying, you're not saying it in Latin anymore. They're saying it in French or in Spanish or in English. So there were two declarations from Rome. The latter declaration from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, moreover, was reprinted in Noticiae, accompanied by a rather strange commentary. The author of Dominican specifically mentioned Pius XII's Constitution Sacramentum Ordinis, the one that, I, that we have here and how each new sacramental formula continues to signify the special grace conferred by the sacrament and the need to preserve the validity of the sacramental rite. So in other words, what he's saying is they promulgate the, they promulgate the rite and they have to be issuing notices and you know, keeping people calm and quiet because people were actually worried about this issue. This, the expression spiritu, Spiritus Principalis comes from the Psalm Miserere, Spiritum Principalis Confirma Me. And in there, it actually doesn't mean the Holy Ghost, apparently. Or it, or it could mean anything, but it usually is not translated as the Holy Ghost. Its meaning there is not necessarily linked to what the expression in the consecration prayer meant for the third century Christian. 
Spirit designates the Holy Ghost. But he says, so I, I skipped a part here. In Latin is Spiritus Principalis. In the Greek of St. Hippolytus is hegemonikos. I'll just put it in. What did the Greek hegemonikos means? And the Latin principalis. It means this, he says. This is all, this is all explanations from Don Bot. Each of the three holy orders has a gift of the Holy Ghost. And not, not the same for each. For deacons, it is the spirit of seal and for solicitude. For priests, the spirit of counsel. For the bishops, it is the spirit of authority. The bishop is both leader who must govern and high priest of the sanctuary. He is the ruler of the church. So the word hegemonicos, principalis, is understandable. So therefore, this means the gift of the spirit proper to a leader. This was the, the commentary that, he, that they sent with those documents from Rome. Father Chicada says, it was a very erudite-sounding erudite explanation. Unfortunately, it is false, a typical case of uh, brazen double-talk modernists. Spiritus principalis can mean many things. Let's look at the different meanings. In the dictionaries, they render the adjective governing as originally existing, basic, primary, first in importance or esteem, chief, befitting leading men or princes, this is the words of the the meaning of the word principalis. All of those things it can mean. Hegemonia means authority, command, rule, office of a superior, episcopal of a superior of a convent, hence of, spe of sphere of bishops, rural diocese. But even in this sense, it doesn't connot the spirit, the, the the orders, the granting of the orders of the bishop. As I said, he says in the point number two, in Psalm 50, the word is used, Spiritus Principalis. And there, in English, they usually translate it as perfect spirit, as a generous spirit. Despite them both's claim that the meaning of governing spirit in the psalm was unrelated to its supposed third century meaning in the prayer for Episcopal consecration, a Greek patristic dictionary directly links both passages and even quotes the Greek excerpt from Hippolytus. We're almost done, just a little bit more. In point number three, he tells us the Holy Fathers, the first saints and bishops of the church, when they used the word principalis or hegemonicos, they would use it referring to the Father, to the Holy Ghost, even just to the virtue of fortitude, to a power strengthening against temptations, they would use it in every single way. Monsignor Paul is the one that we studied in the seminary. He wrote a whole book of theology. And in point four, he tells us, he, Monsignor Paul, this is before Vatican II, translates the governing spirit in the psalm, not as the Holy Ghost itself, but just as an external divine effect, a supernatural spirit of rectitude and self-control, good disposition. Point number six is also interesting. In the Coptic rite, one of the ones that they use as a, as a supposedly rite that has this as well. An abbot, you know that abbots are not the same that bishops. Abbot is just a priest that is a superior in the monastery. Well, in the Coptic rite, they use this work, this word, when they are instilling the abbot. They say hegemonicos, spirit, upon this person. They are imposing their hands on the priest's head and they say, May hegemonicos spirit of gentleness and love and patience and graciousness. But this person is not made a bishop. That's just a priest. And when he gives another a bunch of other uh, examples like that, but I do want to skip a little bit because uh, we're taking too long already. The question is, we have spiritus principalis, the, the governing spirit. Is this univocally? The grace of the Holy Ghost? I think the answer is quite obviously no. And think about it. I mean, what you're saying, uh, a principal spirit, a perfect spirit, a good spirit, it can be, as I said, it can be an angel. It can be the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. It can be any, any other thing. If you're talking about the Trinity, it would be uh, complex 
theological argument there, but the point is, this is not univocal. And so he concludes in, point, in paragraph D. Pius XII, in his apostolic constitution, declared that the form for holy orders must univocally signify the sacramental effects, the power of order, and the grace of the Holy Ghost. The new form fails in two of these points. It is not univocal. The expression governing spirit can mean anything. It's ambiguous. And it fails also, next page, in that it doesn't signify the power of order. Among these many different meanings, however, we do not find the power of orders of the episcopacy. The expression governing spirit does not even equivocally connote the sacrament of holy orders in any sense. I'm going to try to summarize the rest of it, but I just want to cover this really quickly. I'll read you the form again, and we'll say this. Let's say that governing spirit was the Holy Ghost. You receive the Holy Ghost when you go to confirmation. You receive the Holy Ghost when you go to baptism. You receive the Holy Ghost basically in every sacrament. You receive in some way the action of the Holy Ghost. The, thing, the apostles received the Holy Ghost in every single sacrament that they themselves received. The question here is, does this, would this signify the orders? Let's read it again. So now pour upon this chosen one, that power which is from you, the governing spirit. And let's say, let's say that this was a thing that was done in baptism. And let me know if you, will, you would find it inappropriate for some reason. That power which is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved son, Jesus Christ, the spirit given by him to the holy apostles, who founded the church in every place to be your temple, for the unceasing glory and praise of your name. All I'm saying, even if I say that that means the Holy Ghost, all I'm saying is, may this person receive the Holy Ghost. Nothing else. Because it does speak of the apostles, but it doesn't say, give, them, give him the spirit that you gave to the apostles so that they founded the church. It says, give him the spirit that you gave the apostles who founded the Holy Church. You're not relating one and the other. Okay, we'll finish really quickly. Is it a substantial change then? The question was, is the new form a substantial change? Was the meaning changed? I think that we can establish that the meaning is very substantially changed. At the very, very, very best, it would be doubtful. At the very best. And at the very worst, it's absolutely invalid. And how does that change it? In point number eight. A substantial change in the meaning of a sacramental form renders a sacrament invalid, and this leads us to this conclusion. Accordingly, an, epico an episcopal consecration conferred with the form promulgated by Paul VI is invalid. I'll try to end the talk here, but I just cover, I'll cover the next two points very briefly. One of the arguments that... Uh, one of the arguments that Father Gregory Hesse says is, well, context, it's saved by context. Because even in, if in the form, it doesn't say the Episcopal orders, but in other parts of the prayers, it says something about the Episcopal consecration. But the problem is that they said that was the form, and not only that, that's when you impose the hands. Remember, you have to have matter and form. When I impose the hands, that's when I have to say the form. If there are prayers around, but these two are not happening, then it doesn't matter if the, about the context. And Father Chikada gives an example, and I gave it to you at the beginning. If I pray the whole of the baptism, and I, all the context, and then I change substantially the form of baptism, all of the context is not going to save the sacrament. I didn't do it, right? And let's say that there is a prayer right before I pour the water, that I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, congratulations to the fathers. Now the child has been received in the church, and we are now pouring the water on his head. That was not a baptism. Why? Because they were disconnected. When I said the words, I didn't do the action. And when I did the action, I was talking about something else. So the context will not save it.
for the sacrament, you have to have matter and form. No context. The other argument is, but the Pope approved. Can the Pope change the sacraments? This is a good, an important argument. Can the Pope change the sacraments? Every theologian, and even the Popes themselves, and he will give you the quotes in there, every theologian will say, the Pope can change accidentally the part around the sacraments. He cannot change substantially the sacraments because that was established by Christ. No one can change that. The Church does not have that authority. And that actually was told to us by, this, by the same Pope, Pius XII, in, that, in, this, in, in uh, part number 10, in number A, he says, In the beginning of Sacramentum Ordinis, Pius XII, reiterating the teaching of the Council of Trent, states, The Church has no power over the substance of the sacraments, that is, over those things which, as is proved from the sources of divine revelation, Christ the Lord himself established to, keep, to be kept as sacramental signs. As regards holy orders, the Church possesses no power over the meaning of the form because it pertains to the substance of the sacrament instituted by Christ. Christ himself prescribed that for holy orders, the Church uses signs and words capable of expressing the power of order. So there you have it, and you can, you can read more on this. It's a, it's a very good document to have. You can have it. I'll conclude by just uh, stating a few things, and I'll try to, to raise your spirits before I let you go. There's a Bonsi house out there. You, you have some time to <laughs> use it. Just let's try to finish before the kids do so that you can go first. <laughs> the consequences of this are terrible, as you all know, because as we said in the beginning, if these are not real bishops, then these are not real priests. And therefore, all you have here is maybe baptism, depending on their intention, maybe marriage, depending on whether if they kept the law of the church, and the perfect act, act of contrition. You'd have to determine was that bishop consecrated with the old rite or with the new rite? Was that priest ordained by a bishop consecrated by the new rite or the old rite? And was he ordained with the new rite or the old rite? And that's one of the big problems with the Fraternity of St. Peter. That their priests are ordained in the old rite by new bishops. Therefore, they have huge churches and all the incense and a lot of servers and all the choirs and beautiful CDs that I actually buy because some of them are really good. But it's lay people singing. It's lay people uh, pretending to give the sacraments. If, I'm, I'm just going to say it like that, if this is true, right? Those are the implications of this. And that's why it makes perfect sense, and we might come to that point, it makes perfect sense that once all the priests are gone, then they would give us the Latin Mass. Because by that time, it's just a way to keep you here and not, not uh, have you wandering around. Another thing that I would have you consider is this. I'm a Pope. Let's say I'm a Pope and I am wanting the good of the Church. Why on earth would I change the consecration of bishops? What good reason would I have? Who knows that? It's been in the Church for 2,000 years. Who knows even what you say in the consecration of bishops among the faithful? As we were saying before, nobody even sees it of among the faithful. I mean, it's an important thing, obviously. You want to have it right. But how interesting it is that all the sacraments that the faithful see were changed just a little bit, not too much, nothing too drastic. And that the consecration of bishops is changed entirely and doubtfully. Me as a pope, why would I do that? What good reason would I have? to do something like that. There is no reason whatsoever. It's, it's the most important thing that you can have in the church, the most significant one. Like From this depends everything, basically. Why on earth would I mess with that if it wasn't because I had the intention of destroying it? And I think that's, that's what it has to be.
Again, this is my opinion. I'm not saying you have to take it, but here's the information. You can analyze it. As I said, I'm going to try to get those books so that we can see them, and then you can make an informed decision. And to raise your spirits up, uh, I want to share to you, with you two things. You know, uh, we see these things and we come to realize how, how terrible the situation is in the church today and, and how difficult it seems. But uh, something very good about these times is that all it takes for you to be a saint is to persevere. You don't have to go and, and fly up the, up, you know, above the rooftops of the church or you don't have to be getting in ecstasy while you're praying or things like that. Uh, our Lord said in the gospel when he's talking about the last times, he who perseveres to the end, he shall be saved. And St. Francis and St. Teresa had visions about these times. St. Francis said to his friars, a time will come. He said, he was talking about his order and he was saying, this order is going to degenerate in the sense that many will join it for glory, for vain glory, you know, for, to achieve glory before men. But that will change because a, a time will come, he said, where people will throw away the books of good doctrine, where nobody will accept the doctrine of the church. And then those who join the church and those who join this order will do it only for the love of God. And that is the beautiful thing about those of us who are Catholic today. Before you could be a Catholic just because your family was Catholic. Now, just the mere fact that you're a Catholic signifies a very internal decision, a very uh, serious decision of wanting to follow God no matter what the cost. And so I, I believe that the saints and the angels see us today unworthy as, you know, one might be. But the angels see us today and, and they see, well, I'm, they're glad to see these souls that are doing this hard thing just for the love of God. So that's all it takes to be a saint today. St. Teresa also had a vision about the last times. St. Teresa was really funny too. She, she had a vision where she says, at the latter times, again, many orders will fall, many will abandon the faith. And she says, I saw a group of people, an order, that were dressed in white with swords and were defending the faith among all others. And there were very few, but they were, they were standing in there defending the faith. And they received a great reward. And here's where she's funny, she says, I'm not going to tell who it is so that everybody strives to get there. <laughs> and then you had the Jesuits fighting with the Carmelites and everybody fighting to see who it was, you know, because the Jesuits say, oh, it was us. And then the Carmelites say, no, it was us. And the CMRI probably says, no, it was us. <laughs> so, but again, it goes to, to show the same, that in, in these times, uh, these things that we're living is what is making us saints. And the fights that you have with your family, with your friends, when you go to Walmart and you're wearing a long skirt, uh, when you have to drive two hours for Mass, that is a slow martyrdom that you're suffering, and, and you will get a reward according to that. The important thing is to persevere in the faith. When it gets rough, when it gets difficult, when you don't feel anything, don't be a modernist. It's not about feelings. Persevere. As our Lord said, he who perseveres to the end, he will be saved. And so that is the beautiful time that we get to live in, where this is how we get to be saints. This is what we, this is our persecution, our martyrdom. And someday, maybe in the future of the church, they'll look back and they'll think of the heroic holy bishops that held the faith and the people that helped the bishops and were there, you know, suffering that moral persecution. That is our lot. So we have to be worthy of it and try to live as best as we can, loving our Lord Jesus Christ and our Blessed Mother. Thank you for listening to The Catholic Wire. If you have found this show helpful, please say a prayer for all our collaborators. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels and share with your friends. For questions and comments, you may contact us at thecatholicwire.org.